All right, let's get started. Hey guys, <clears throat> so welcome to the second uh, class of the cryptocurrency decal. Uh, could we have a quick show of hands? Like, uh, raise your hand if you thought the quiz was easy. Oh, nice. But what about too hard? Okay. What about like just right? Okay. Cool. Noted. All right. So I'm I'm really excited for today. Uh, this is the most important lecture in this course. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to give you a solid fundamental understanding of consensus and Bitcoin. Uh, and the rest of the course is going to kind of derive from these sets of principles. So it's really important that you understand these. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just get started then. <clears throat> okay, so today we'll go back over some of the Bitcoin basics to kind of drum that into you. Uh, but it'll be much more detailed this time. Uh, we'll go through a 30-slide consensus buildup made by this man named Vijay, who basically takes all the components of Bitcoin and builds it up from scratch, so you can see why each piece is needed, uh, like its purpose, uh, to give you a full conceptual understanding. <clears throat> we'll go over mining, so dive a little deeper into the mining overview, and then if we have some extra time, we'll cover... Uh, forking the network and Merkle trees. <clears throat> yeah, sure. <clears throat> All right. So uh, this slide probably looks familiar to you because it was in the last lecture. Just reiterating some points. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. It's the first cryptocurrency. It's the main cryptocurrency. Uh, and some community terminology so you know what I'm referring to. Uh, the scope of this course mainly covers crypto. So that's really math heavy, cryptography heavy. It's really uh, wide spanning in terms of technology. Um, when you, whenever you hear about private blockchains or say permission ledgers, it's talking about what banks and large financial institutions are into or interested in. They're looking at a subset of the technology of Bitcoin and more just trying to find use cases out of that. <clears throat> so from a technical standpoint, it's not actually that interesting. Um, and then lastly, blockchain is just the umbrella term for anything that uses like this just distributed ledger technology and has a consensus mechanism. Um, that's, yeah, blockchain. Okay, so one year ago, I actually gave this same lecture on consensus. Um, I'd also included this exact slide on implications of blockchain technology. And I'm not changing this because I want to illustrate what I mean when I said last time that crypto moves really fast. So it's, it's kind of interesting to uh, dive into the semantics of the following. So in 2015, all coins were very low value. Uh, Dash, for example, used to be at $2.4. Now it's at $11. So it's increased 5x. <clears throat> Bitcoin 2.0 is also interesting because it's not a term that anyone really uses anymore. Back then, Bitcoin used to be the main thing that people talked about in the crypto space. But, and Bitcoin 2.0 was the idea of using blockchains for non-financial applications. Now, non-financial applications are the main thing that people are interested in, uh, like Ethereum. And uh, Bitcoin 2.0 isn't uh, relevant anymore. <clears throat> uh, back in 2015, remittances... Uh, people still thought that Bitcoin was good for remittances, but um, as of recently, no one really thinks that anymore. Um, and then the be your own bank, 100% uptime. That was something that people used to tout as a great feature of Bitcoin, but now people are looking for other ways. They realize that's not actually uh, that valuable. And some of the hot topics at the time. Uh, in 2015, it was the peak of the block size debate. It really divided the community. Um, there was, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, criticism thrown left and right. And this was also the time when banks were first starting to look into financial uh, implications of blockchain technology. Uh, fast forward to today, and the banks are now actually building it now. Or at least they're trying to. Um, yeah, so private blockchains. Uh, we'll cover some of the... Here's... Here's the basic concept of identity in Bitcoin. So how do you own Bitcoin? You're essentially sending money between pseudonyms. 
which is the same as your address or your public key. And Bitcoin relies on a digital signature scheme, in particular elliptic curves. And that's basically you have a public-private key pair. Whenever you pick a private key just randomly, you generate your public keys. And for those of you not in uh, computer science, you can think of this like an email address and password. If you want to receive emails from someone, you give them your email address. And to unlock and see those emails, you, you, you need your password, which is your private key. Uh, Bitcoin also has a one-way hash function, SHA-256, which is one of the most powerful uh, and ro most robust uh, hash functions available. We'll see why that's useful in the next few slides. Um, and essentially, when you own Bitcoin, you're hiding your Bitcoin in the large amount of public keys. Uh, you can generate as many key pairs as you want just by picking different private keys, finding the related public keys, and here, for example, is a public key. Um, it's a really long string, so there, that means there's a lot of possible addresses. In particular, there's two to the 160th possible addresses, uh, which is this number right here. Uh, so to, one way to visualize this is if you imagine all the beaches on Earth, uh, all the underground sand, all the grains of sand on Earth, uh, that number is two to the 63rd. Now, if for every grain of sand, there is another Earth, each with its own respective grains of sand, uh, that whole collection is 2 to the 126, which is still only 0.8058% of this large number, 2 to the 160th. So that's why we say that it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to steal someone else's money by guessing their private key. Yeah. Also, that's my Bitcoin address if you want to send me some money. <laughs> so, yeah, Bitcoin exists as software. Uh, whenever you create a wallet, it creates a gener uh, generates a public-private key pair for you, uh, which would also become your address. So here right here uh, is the Coinbase Receive Money screen. Whenever you press Receive Money, it doesn't really do anything. It just shows you, okay, this is the QR code for the Bitcoin address that you should send to everyone else. And when you send money, all you need to do is specify an address and an amount. Uh, it's really simple what you are. But what happens is uh, once you actually like press that send button, the transaction is broadcast to the network where miners will verify it and add it to the transaction history. <clears throat> so diving a little deeper into transactions. Last time we just said, oh, Bitcoin is inputs and outputs. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so transactions can have any number of inputs and they can have any number of outputs. And essentially when you're spending Bitcoin, you're actually spending the output of a previous transaction. So for example, right here, you can see that transaction one is spending output zero of transaction zero. And transaction three is spending this output right here. Um, so s the typical coffee shop example, say I have uh, one Bitcoin that was given to me in a previous transaction. I have like this output of one Bitcoin. Um, if I want to use that one Bitcoin to buy a coffee of denomination 0 0.01, then I would create a transaction with the input as that output. Um, the previous output now becomes the input of one Bitcoin, and I have 0 0.01 going to the coffee shop, and I have 0.99 going back to myself. So that's what the typical transaction looks like. You have the the output that actually pays out the Bitcoin, and you have like a change address, which then becomes the, the output that you use when you're trying to spend what's remaining. Uh, and lastly, fees in Bitcoin are implicit. So how you calculate fees are you add up all the inputs, and you add up all the outputs, and the difference between the two is the fee that is collected by miners when it's included in a block. <clears throat> so yeah, blocks and blockchain, this is uh, pretty simple. So blocks, ordered bunch of transactions, it most importantly timestamps these transactions, puts them in a particular block, and these blocks are immutable for reasons we'll see later. Uh, each of these block references a previous block, and that's how you form the blockchain. So each block also has a height. The height is basically from zero to uh, the height, like the, the genesis block, the first block had height zero, and now we're at around 420,000, um, and a depth. The depth is basically how deep 
in the blockchain from the most recent block uh, your particular block is. Yeah, question? So why can't you just like, send like, back to yourself, like a change address? Why can't I just send like, to a broker one? Oh, because you need to, every transaction in Bitcoin has to be spending uh, a previous output. Like, and each output can only be spent once. So this system is actually called triple ledger accounting, or triple entry accounting. Um, yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Maybe I can ask you after. Okay. okay. Yeah. Is there any like, a limit on how many uh, transaction per block? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a technical limit on. So each transaction has a certain number of data bytes, like the size of it, mm -hmm. and each block can only hold one megabyte of transactions. Yeah. So right here is a screenshot of a transaction. Uh, typically, whenever you want to look at any kind of block information, you use a block explorer. Uh, the one for Bitcoin that most people use is blockchain.info. Uh, and you can see we have one input and a bunch of outputs. And all these outputs have been spent, and here's like the unspent transaction. So these are no longer able to be used for future transactions, while this one, like if they wanted to make another transaction, like this is what they'd use. You'll notice that uh, the total input minus the total output is uh, the fee right here. And you can also see the block height. And at this time, there were 854 confirmations, meaning that it was 854 blocks deep from the most recent block. Question? Um, where does the fee go? Uh, the fee goes to miners when they include it in a block. Oh. Yeah. All right, so I also want to reiterate this idea. So when you're spending Bitcoin, you're not spending a Bitcoin. Like, oh, I'm not spending one Bitcoin and my account was deducted by one. I'm spending this Bitcoin. So this is analogous to uh, rye stones of the Yap Islands. So this civilization, they had these giant stones that uh, were scattered around the island. Everyone knew where they were, what they looked like. And instead of actually moving the stones around, they just agreed on who owned the stones. So by exchanging that agreement, that allows you to use these giant stones as currency. So with Bitcoin, when you're, uh, when you're spending money, you, you say, oh, I'm going to spend this Bitcoin. Now this Bitcoin belongs to you. Yeah. Any questions? So in a sense, there's just a giant repository globally of Bitcoins and everyone just agrees on who owns what. Uh, yeah. And that, that giant repository of Bitcoins is the UTXO set, the unspent transaction outputs. Yeah. And so in this case, um, in the last lecture, you said that some Bitcoins were stolen, right? Yeah. So if they were stolen, then why can you not just, like, why can the community not agree that those stolen Bitcoins don't belong to whoever they currently belong to? Yeah, they, I mean, they, they can. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's more complex than that. Um, because these blocks are immutable, they can't just like make another transaction. And they also can't just crack the cryptography to make another transaction. So it has to be some other means. Yeah. We could talk more after the lecture. That's like a, actually a really involved question. OK, so <laughs> this is, remember, not Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, so recap. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin in 2009, and it was the first ever decentralized, trustless system for uh, digital payments. And what he did was he solved the double spending problem, which is um, in a digital, distributed digital currency, how do you prevent someone from spending the same asset twice? His solution was the blockchain and something called proof of work. The more general problem that he solved was the Byzantine generals problem, like the the distributed nature of Bitcoin is actually just a specific instantiation of the Byzantine general's problem. So this problem is um, you have a group of generals surrounding a city, and they need to vote on whether they want to attack the city or they want to retreat. Um, but the key thing is they need to be in agreement. Otherwise, it's way worse than just everyone attacking or everyone retreating. So, but there's several caveats. <clears throat> these generals are physically separated, and to communicate, they need to use messengers. And these messengers might fail, they might be faulty, they might be corrupted. Um, so this is kind of like a real-world situation where you have computers talking to each other in a network, 
and you have like spotty connections or someone manages to man in the middle attack you. Um, these generals themselves may also be loyal or intentionally traitorous. So not only can they abstain their vote intentionally, they can also uh, try to mess everyone else up by telling half the generals, uh, I vote to attack, and telling the other half, I vote not to attack. Um, so Byzantine, tolerance, or Byzantine fault tolerance is basically when you can achieve unanimous consensus among the loyal generals um, despite uh, a minority of the generals being malicious or being unable to communicate for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so I, I want you to hold this idea in your head. This is, uh, just hold this problem in your head as we build up Bitcoin from scratch because it's going to be very similar. All right. Okay, so yeah, here we go. So in version one, if Alice wants to send a Bitcoin to Bob, she should write and sign this message, I, Alice, am giving Bob one Bitcoin. Um, in Bitcoin, each of these little paper icons represents a transaction, and Alice's signature ensures that she can't turn around and just say, oh, I, I never sent that Bitcoin, because you have Alice's signature on the transaction. Uh, and remember at this point, there's no trusted central bank to uh, keep a record of anything. <clears throat> Next, Alice should send the transaction to everyone running the Bitcoin software. Everyone now knows that Alice has one less Bitcoin and Bob has one more. So this first version has a major flaw. What if Alice sends five identical messages? What does that mean? Does Bob now have five different Bitcoins or five duplicates of the same Bitcoin? <clears throat> so you solve this by introducing serial numbers to make Bitcoins uniquely identifiable. Now if Alice wants to send a Bitcoin to Bob, she should send the message, I, Alice, am giving Bob one Bitcoin with serial number 8732. This way, Alice can only spend each Bitcoin once. Wait, do Bitcoins have serial numbers or does each Satoshi have a serial number? Because like, how do you divide the serial number? Uh, yeah, it's the transaction output. Yeah, the, the unspent transaction outputs. Yeah. So in this case, every, not necessarily every Bitcoin, but every like Satoshi, it can change its serial number, right? It yeah, yeah, so that's, that's how you can maintain divisibility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So the problem with this approach is where do these serial numbers come from? And how do we manage who owns which Bitcoin? With serial numbers, Bob can ensure that Alice doesn't send him the same Bitcoin, but how can he ensure that Alice had that Bitcoin in the first place? So to make version 2 work, there needs to be a trusted source of serial numbers. And the traditional source is a bank. Now, the bank would provide these serial numbers for the Bitcoins, keep track of who owns which Bitcoin, and verify that transactions are legitimate. Now when Alice sends her transaction to Bob, Bob can check with the bank that the Bitcoin actually belonged to her and that it is unique. Now the problem in this is we kind of just defeated the whole pur purpose of Bitcoin because it's centralized. Uh, so what you do is you bring back that decentralized structure by making everyone the bank. Now everyone has a complete record of all the transactions. In Bitcoin, this is called the blockchain. yeah blockchain. <laughs> All right, so now when Alice sends her transaction to Bob, he can check his copy of the blockchain to be sure that the Bitcoin actually belonged to Alice. If that works out, Bob announces this transaction to the world and the rest of them add it to their copy of the blockchain. However, what if Alice sends her her transaction to Bob and Charlie simultaneously. Bob will find that the Bitcoin belonged to Alice, Charlie will find the Bitcoin belonged to Alice, and both of them will broadcast this transaction to the rest of the network. What does everyone else do? Um, obviously, Bob and Charlie can't both have the same Bitcoin, so we have a problem. <clears throat> we can begin to solve this problem by giving everyone the power to verify a transaction. Now when Alice sends her transaction to Bob, 
Bob shouldn't try to verify the transaction alone. Rather, he should broadcast the possible transaction to the entire network of Bitcoin of users and ask them to help verify it. Um, if enough users verify the transaction, Bob can accept the Bitcoin and everyone will update their copy of the blockchain. This way, if Alice tries to double spend on Bob and Charlie, they'll bo both broadcast that and the other Bitcoin users will notice and they'll reject the transactions. What is enough users? Like, how many? Uh, I mean, we haven't built up a double spending prevention yet, so that question isn't like applicable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So I know you said like uh, the block depth is something like four hundred twenty thousand uh, feet. Um, at, at like one megabyte each, isn't that quite a bit for everyone to have a full copy of the whole blockchain? Yeah, so that is. Yeah, that is very true. Um, like, I guess how does that? How, I kind of. Yeah, I don't know how that's like solved. Like, yeah, you can uh, you can solve that by uh, maintaining just the UTXO set, and there's uh, there's a way to prune the data structure of each block so that you have all the necessary information to verify that um, this transaction exists, but you don't actually need to save everyone else's. Um, there's something called SPE wallets, which are simplified payment verification, uh, outlined in the Bitcoin white paper. Yeah. Okay, so uh, remember that if Alice tries to double spend on Bob and Charlie, everyone else notices and they reject these transactions. So there's a problem. Alice could double spend on Bob and Charlie by taking over the Bitcoin network. She can use an automated system to set up a large number of separate identities and overwhelm the Bitcoin network. Now when Bob and Charlie ask the network to verify their transactions, they're talking to a bunch of Alice's identities. And Alice says, oh, these transactions are fine. So she manages to fool Bob and Charlie into accepting that Bitcoin. <clears throat> the proper term for this is a Sybil attack. Uh, you'll probably hear this a lot. You should probably write that down. Um, it's done by creating many fake identities. Yeah. But there's only one actual copy of the Bitcoin, right? So it, even if that's verified, wouldn't only one of them end up with it? Um, the thing is, if both of them accept the Bitcoin, and dispense some good or service, she's essentially getting two things for the payment of one. Yeah, double spending. Right. So, um, what's the what's the deal with like sending and receiving versus like the people that are mining them? Like, if I just send a Bitcoin, do I also have to copy of the blockchain on my computer? Um, or if I'm getting sent. Yeah, miners verify. Uh, to send and receive Bitcoin, you don't have to have a blockchain. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a Sybil attack here. Um, so we can solve this issue of double spending by implementing the proof of work. In a proof of work system, when Alice wants to give Bob some Bitcoin, she announces her transaction to the entire network. As other users receive Alice's transaction message, they add it to a list of pending transactions. Uh, for example, like this. Um, these are transactions they've been told about but haven't been yet verified by the network. Uh, note that any user can maintain their own list of pending transactions. How long does it take for pending transactions typically to go through? Uh, ten, t uh, 10 minutes, because that's the amount of time for a block. To, yeah, on average. Okay, so now if David wants to verify these pending transactions in a proof of work system, he has to do three things. First, he needs to check his copy of the blockchain to see that the transaction is legitimate. Uh, he needs to expend some amount of computational power by solving a difficult math problem. And then he needs to broadcast this transaction out to the network. So remember that. Uh, before we take a closer look, remember that if David doesn't want to verify any transactions, he doesn't have to. He can just let other users do that for him. So you might be wondering, why does David's computer need to solve a math puzzle? This is a really important question. By requiring David's computer to solve a math puzzle, we're actually solving the double spending problem. So let's take a look at that again. So when Alice sets up 
a large number of separate identities on the blockchain. She can double spend on Bob and Charlie. We want to make it really costly for Alice to double spend, but it's hard to identify a malicious or dishonest actor before they act. So what do we do? We make it hard for anyone to verify transactions. And in that, in, uh, we make it costly for anyone to verify transactions. And in Bitcoin, that's called the proof of work. So you can think of proof of work as a competition to verify transactions. In Bitcoin, this is also referred to as mining, right? If your computer solves the math puzzle before the other computers on the network, you will verify the pending transactions and receive some Bitcoin as a reward. Proof of work prevents bad actors like Alice from double spending because it puts them in competition with everyone else on the network trying to verify transactions. And so long as the majority of the computing power on the network is controlled by honest people, malicious actors like Alice will have a hard time doing dishonest things like double spending. So how hard would this math problem be? Would it, like how long would it take to do it? Uh, um, the, the difficulty of the math problem is adjusted so that it takes the entire network an average of 10 minutes to do it. Yeah. What's this called, Alice, from setting up a bunch of computers that all feed into one that's doing the transaction or the verification and then like, spits out, hey, all 70 of my identities agree? Uh, because it's based on computational power, not your identity. So she would need to have a majority of the computational power in order to overwhelm the network, instead of just saying like, "Oh, like these are legitimate or whatever." But wouldn't it seem to everyone else that she has like seventy computers worth, even though it's just one? Uh, no, because in order to overwhelm everyone else, she needs to create blocks faster than everyone else, and to do that requires more computational power than everyone else. So everyone doing these creating these blocks is doing different work. Uh. They're working on similar problems, and once any of them solves their problem, they broadcast it, and the other people like accept, oh, this is the solution, let's move on to the next problem. Yeah, it's okay, we'll, we'll cover the rest of this. Um, if, if there's more questions after we go over the mining part, then you should speak up. Yeah? So only one person, or one machine, has to solve the problem and it's verified, like you're no longer looking Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Um, and the security in is in that it's really hard to solve this problem. And over the long run, so long as you have the majority of the computational power, you're going to be solving these problems faster than the dishonest nodes. So you'll be creating the longest chain, which is why we always assume the longest chain is the correct one, because it has the most computational power behind it. Are there multiple solutions to this problem? Um, yeah, we, there are. There's, there's other things called like proof of stake. Yeah. Okay. All right. So a quick summary. Um, first, we establish what a transaction is, uh, establish the uniqueness of Bitcoins, um, so the rye stones. Uh, then everyone has a shared record of transactions, and everyone verifies these transactions. But in order to secure the identity aspect, you introduce the proof of work, which ultimately prevents the double spending. Now we're going to bring the consensus system you just learned about back into the world of Bitcoin, uh, much more technically by exploring mining. So yeah, the solution to the Byzantine General's problem was the proof of work, where the, these miners are constantly competing, constantly competing to solve this really, really difficult problem. And the proof of work is called the Byzantine consensus algorithm. There are several criteria. First, it needs to be easy to verify and hard to compute. So the Schaff 256 hash function actually satisfies these. Um, since it can hash any arbitrary data and always gets the same output, you can't really go backwards. That's why it's called the one-way hash function. And uh, it's pretty much random, which is very useful for uh, actually implementing the proof of work itself. We'll see. Uh, and here's an example of two SHA-256 uh, hashes. One is Donald Trump and the other is Donald Trump with a lowercase t. And you can see that just by changing one letter, the output's completely different. So this exhibits one of uh, the, the signs of a good hash function. A little change in input creates a huge change in output. 
<clears throat> so when you find the proof of work and you find the solution to this block, you can add this block to the blockchain. Um, and the miner who finds this block is allowed to make a special transaction called the Coinbase transaction, which rewards themselves with the mining reward. And that mining reward is currently 12.5 Bitcoin. Um, this miner broadcasts the block, and the other nodes verify and add it to their own copy of the blockchain. Isn't that like $8,000 here? Uh, 12.5 times 600. Yeah. How many blocks are there? Huh? How many blocks are there? Per, um, per there's, day? Uh, there's one every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, someone's getting 12.5 Bitcoin? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So because of that, uh, and you also have the block reward halves every two years. So recently it halved in July. Um, this eventually tapers out to 21 million total Bitcoins in existence, which also means that Bitcoin is a deflationary currency. Um, and just some basic stats, there's about 15.2 million Bitcoins in circulation today, uh, 9.6 billion market cap, and the price is currently around $600 per Bitcoin. Doesn't having a deflationary currency pose long-term economic problems for it? Uh, yeah, that's like another... like. Discussion though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of arguments you can make there. Okay, so what exactly is the mining problem? What you do is you take these three components. You take the Merkle root, which you can think of as a summary of the transactions in the block. Um, you have the hash of the previous block, which is what creates the blockchain structure, and then you have a nonce. And the actual problem is you Keep on hashing these three things together and incrementing the nonce until you reach a requisite number of zeros, uh, of leading zeros, that is defined by the difficulty. Um, so, yeah, basically you try, okay, there's not enough zeros, let me try again, but there's not enough zeros, until you find one. And this difficulty adjusts every 2016 blocks, or every two weeks, to regulate the block creation. Um, it's actually technically 20... 15 because the Bitcoin core implementation has an off by one error. So, fun fact. Yeah. Okay. So, really important 51% um, attack. So, uh, as we keep on reiterating over and over and over again, the major assumption of Bitcoin is that no more than 51% of the network is dishonest. So, if you have a majority with the, uh, that has the um, Honest nodes control the majority of the computational power. That means they're going to solve this proof of work faster than everyone else. They're going to create these blocks faster than everyone else. And basically, any attackers that are trying to create an alternate history of transactions will not be able to keep up. And they will not be able to form the longest proof of work chain. So 51% attack is basically an attempt to overwhelm the mining power of the network. And you can see here a graph of the Bitcoin network hash rate over time. So this is not logarithmic or anything, but you can see, like, compared to the hash rates of today, the first four years of Bitcoin seem pretty much non-existent. And what's this unit right here? So that's hashes per second. And we start with uh, one, like one hash per second. You have kilo hash, mega hash, giga hash, uh, tera hash, peta hash. Uh, and then now this is 1.3 exa hash. So we've created the most powerful computer in the world, but it can only do one thing, SHA-256. How yeah. much computing power does each hash take? Uh, like very little. It, um, like one hash is, I, I, I don't know how to quantify it, but you can run it like basically instantly. Yeah. And that's per second you're doing that? Yeah, this is per second, so yeah. And we're devoting how much energy into these hashes per second? <laughs> uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's funny because uh, the, the Bitcoin mining has actually really driven ASIC development. So now you have, I think it's like 19 nanometer chips or something. It's just ridiculously power efficient because that's how you make money, by making like really power efficient computation. Yeah. yeah and I wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So.
So a summary of Bitcoin mining. Um, functions as a minting mechanism. So you originally start with zero Bitcoin. You need to distribute it in some fair way. Why not give it to the people who are contributing computational power and therefore securing the network? Um, so yeah, it's an incentive for people to secure the network. And it's the key thing that enables you to reach consensus in a distributed uh, currency. <laughs> Um, so, bring it back together to a transaction flow. If I want to send money to Sunny, oh, he's not here. Uh, I sign the transaction and I broadcast it to the network, and all these other peers add it to something called a zero conf pool. Uh, the zero conf pool is, uh, if you remember in the buildup, there was the list of pending transactions. It's basically all the transactions that have zero confirmations, uh, meaning they haven't been included in a block yet. Um, they verify these transactions, and once a miner finds a proof of work. They add, they've essentially added all of their transactions in their zero conf pool into a block. Um, they've solved this block essentially, and uh, they broadcast it. Other miners verify, and then they start moving on to the next problem. So once a transaction in a block, it's like verified. Yeah. Well, um, technically, you shouldn't accept, you shouldn't pay out uh, a good or service until roughly six confirmations because there's instances where um, two miners can find a block at roughly the same time, and it's like a race to propagate the block across the rest of the network, and there will be a temporary fork. So after six blocks, it's extremely unlikely that uh, there will still be a fork and your transaction will be invalid. Yeah. Does every miner work on the same block? Uh, no. Every miner is, is working on a slightly different problem, which you'll see why in a few slides. Yeah. So if there's like a fork, how is that resolved? Um, basically, like it's really unlikely that it's gonna keep like oh two miners keep on releasing blocks at the same time. So eventually, one of the chains is gonna be longer, and the miners on the minority chain will switch over to the longer chain. Yeah. So when uh, a miner succeeds and like creates a new block, does every pending transaction get included in that block? Uh, not necessarily. From the uh, start of that. When they started on the problem. Yeah, it's up to the miner to in, uh, it's up to the miner what transactions they include. So uh, a lot of them will order by fee, like by priority. I mean, because it makes most sense. Yeah. Um, if you if you were a miner and you wanted to blacklist someone and not like verify any of their transactions, then you could still do that. Yeah. So there are two ways miners can mine the, the transaction fees and the block, like twelve point five, whatever. Yeah, the block reward. Yeah. The block reward is single payoff to one really lucky miner who just finishes up mining the block. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, where, where was it? You can think of, you can think of Bitcoin mining kind of as like a lottery, and if you think of the computational power of the entire network as like this pie of computational power, and you own some per portion of it, that is the probability that you're going to get the next block. And over time, you get a proportionate reward. About what, how, many, uh, how many Bitcoins of transaction fees are there compared, like in each block compared to the Coinbase reward? Um, right now, transaction fees are very low because blocks aren't full. Well, I mean, they're kind of getting full. Um, so for each transaction, it's about uh, like six cents. And... Uh, each, each transaction is about 200 kilobytes on average, I believe. So, wait, no, not 200, like 200 bytes, I think, yeah. So it's just much lower. Yeah, yeah, you can include a lot. I think, I think the limit right now is around seven transactions per second, which is not very high, yeah. So, wait, so if you find, like, if the machine finds a block and it gets, like, 12 Bitcoin or whatever you said, yeah. but, like, the transaction Yeah. The the where does the twelve point five come from? Yeah, oh, that's the uh, money with someone yeah else. yeah that's it's created. It's how uh, you do the initial distribution of coins. Yeah. Okay. So Bitcoin is still distributing right now. Yeah. So why is the total pool like capped at twenty one million Bitcoin? Um, I'm actually not sure. 
Like it was, it was a design consideration. Uh, yeah, scarcity probably. Um, the, I think it was designed by libertarians who hate uh, the Federal Reserve and who like artificially create money and inflation. So, yeah. if we come to that point where there are economic problems with like the twenty one billion or some insurmountable technical problem, how does Bitcoin get updated? Like, could this could you change something fundamental like that? Yeah, um, that is done through this extra credit. I mean, bonus material. Hey, Yay! So, <laughs> so whenever you update Bitcoin software, you're like that, like. That's how you update, you know, the protocol. And there are certain consensus rules. And generally, when you're uh, updating consensus rules, which means like how it defines, it's this block of code that defines how the network kind of comes into agreement. Um, if you're updating these consensus rules, generally you need to use something called a hard fork. So this right here would be an example of a hard fork, where the new software you write is incompatible with the old software. So that's why everyone needs to switch onto your hard fork. Um, otherwise, there'll be two divergent chains. And uh, if you may recall from last lecture, Ethereum uh, tried to hard fork to correct an attack. But then some people continued an old protest on this old chain called Ethereum Classic. And then uh, exchanges started listing Ethereum Classic. And now Ethereum has essentially split into two parts. Yeah. The other case is a soft fork where um, your software update uh, has new rules, but it also follows the old rules. Just to the old software, it might uh, not understand what's going on. But to the new software, um, it understands what's, what's going on as well as everything old. And uh, sometimes uh, this old software violates the new rules. So you can force the people on the old chain to switch to your chain by like having more computational power on this chain, um, which will like basically make all these blocks stale and invalid, which will make them switch over. Yeah. How many hard forks have we had? Uh, Bitcoin has had, I believe, one. Yeah, there was, uh, there was like some bug that allowed, um, allowed you to spend like an infinite amount of Bitcoin, like through some negative number somewhere. Um, and recently there's been, uh, like the block size debate is a debate on whether Bitcoin should hard fork to change one parameter from one megabyte to two megabytes. Um, so with, why wasn't the off by one being corrected? Oh, I mean, because it's, it's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. It's just instead of Bitcoin finishing uh, distribution at exactly the year 2140, it'll be somewhere around there. Yeah. Make the analogy that um, uh, computational power is almost just like voting power. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, one other uh, bonus thing. So Merkle tree. I remember someone asked about uh, immutable transactions. Um, so this is how you make blocks immutable and the entire blockchain immutable. When you have this zero comp pool, you're lining up all your transactions in an order. So you have transactions zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And what you do is you hash those transactions and then you pair up those hashes and then you hash those together. So essentially what you're doing is you're creating something called a Merkle tree, which is a binary uh, hash of all the transactions from bottom to up. And you can also note that like if you make a change to any of these transactions at the bottom, if I change transaction three, it would affect this hash, which would affect this one, which would affect the Merkle root. So that's why we think of the Merkle root as a summary of all transactions in a block. And you can prove that your transaction was in this block by providing, um, say I want to prove that transaction two happened, then all I have to do is save transaction two, and I need to save uh, the hash of transaction three. Um, and that's enough information I could say, oh, you can hash transaction two um, and hash those together and you can drive the Merkle root. Oh, also have to save this one. You can drive the Merkle root and thus I've proved to you that that transaction actually happened. Um, yeah, and also, oh yeah, the question was about mining, each problem being different. Because you include a Coinbase transaction, which has the public key of the miner, 
like to, in order to reward themselves money, it, like the public key is different for each miner. So just that little difference is going to affect um, everything else up here because it's going to be one of the transactions down here which will affect the Merkle group, which will affect the nonce, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for next time, uh, Sunny is going to be giving a lecture on Bitcoin UX, how to actually use and interact with the Bitcoin network. Um, there is no homework because we had a quiz today. And yeah, come up to me if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.